Welcome to The Drum Shuffle, a podcast offering insights, perspectives, and conversations for drummers. I'm your host, Jamie Eads. Hey, how's it going out there, everybody? Welcome to the Drum Shuffle Podcast. Jamie Eads joining you as I do week in and week out. This is episode 137. Hope everybody's having a great week out there in Drumland. We're having a great week over here in beautiful central Kentucky. Super excited about this week's episode. We are going to be joined by one of the legends of the drumming world. This man's blood simply bleeds platinum. He has played on so many platinum selling records. Uh, We're going to be joined by the great Russ Kunkel right after this message from our sponsor, Los Cabos Drumsticks. The best kept secret for drummers is finally out. Los Cabos Drumsticks may look like the sticks you grew up with, but these are not your father's drumsticks. Los Cabos Drumsticks is Canada's number one drumstick brand, and they are coming to a retailer near you. With operations in over 28 countries worldwide, thousands of drummers have already discovered the Los Cabos difference. Using FSC certified wood from Canada and the U.S., Los Cabos make the finest quality drumsticks, percussion tools, and accessories on the market. The best news, Los Cabos Drumsticks offers you a ton of choice. They have 22 individual drumstick models and 14 percussion tools, many of which are available in three different wood types, maple, white hickory, and red hickory. Red hickory comes from the center, or heart, of the hickory tree and has been independently proven to be both stronger and more elastic than white hickory without adding a lot of weight. While most drumstick manufacturers have shunned Red Hickory, Los Cabos Drumsticks has embraced it, becoming the only established stick brand in the world to offer a full line of Red Hickory drumsticks. To learn more about Los Cabos Drumsticks, visit them online at loscabosdrumsticks.com, follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and don't forget to ask for Los Cabos Drumsticks at your favorite retailer. Dare to be different. Join the Red Hickory Revolution with Los Cabos Drumsticks. All right, guys and girls, the time is here. We are about to be joined by the great Russ Kunkel. Um, just do a quick internet search. It is literally quicker for me to say who he hasn't recorded with than to say who he has recorded with. But some of my all-time favorite records, uh, this man put the drums on those iconic songs, James Taylor, Jackson Brown. Uh, I I mean, I could just go on and on. Uh, Russ is currently uh, getting ready to go out on the road with the immediate family. Um, The immediate family is a group of musicians that have played on more records than you can shake a stick at. Uh, They have a new album out. It is fantastic. We talked to Russ about that. Uh, We talked a a little bit about some of those iconic records that he's played on. Uh, He played on one of my all-time favorite artists' records. That is the late, great Warren Zevon. Um, Russ is just a, a, a wealth of information on drumming and how to cut a track that is absolutely superb in the studio. I know you're going to get a lot out of this. Uh, It was such an honor for me to have him on the Drum Shuffle podcast. So please help me welcome Russ Kunkel. Hey, Russ, good afternoon. How are you, sir? I'm great, Jamie. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Uh, Thanks for taking time to come on the Drum Shuffle. You know, um, we've been doing this show now for uh, right at four years, and when I sat down and, and created my first dream guest list, Russ Kunkel was in the top 10. So uh, th- this is a big one for me. So I really do appreciate it. Well, man, I made it into the top 10 finally. I'm really, really happy about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think you're selling yourself quite short. You know, we're, um, we're about a 45 minute program. And I think it would be easier if you just started listing artists you haven't played with. 
uh, rather than going through the list of people you have played with. It's been quite the career for you, has it not? It really has, Jamie, and uh, you know I count my blessings uh, every day. I've been very fortunate uh, to be in the right place at the right time uh, on multiple occasions. Well, you know, I, you say that, and one of the things that has always kind of stuck out to me, um, you know, and, and I've gathered, you know, bits and pieces of this over the years, um, you know, but you are kind of the fabric that weaves together a lot of the the great music going all the way back to the 60s. I know you had an affiliation with the band at one time, um, you know, when, when they were uh, you know, firing on all cylinders, if you will. I know that you were, you know, close with with Jimi Hendrix and, you know, things like that. But it, it really is, you're, you're kind of the fabric that ties together the tapestry of classic rock. Well, Jamie, I got to I gotta say one thing right here that um, that's kind of important to clarify. Um, somewhere back in time, I did an interview while I was in Japan. And, um, and I love being in Japan and I love doing interviews there. But sometimes the way that they translate the interviews, a, a little bit gets lost in translation. Oh, okay. And somehow in some information found its way onto my Wikipedia page, which is not true. And you mentioned two of them. I was friends with the great Lee Von Helm and got to spend a, a whole summer with him in 1974 when I was playing with Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young and the band were on the bill of a big summer tour that we did of a stadium tour in 1974. So I got to be, to spend a lot of quality time with Lee Von, but I was never around the band. I was never with those guys when they were doing the amazing music that they created. But, but, I, but I did work a little bit for Robbie on a few things after the band broke up, and I was friends with Levon. So that's, that's the truth. What Wikipedia says is, is not the truth. And <laughs> as far as the Jimi Hendrix thing goes, a band I was in in the late 60s called Things to Come played a 19-week stint at the Whiskey A Go-Go as the opening act. And we opened for... The, I have a list somewhere of all the bands we opened for, but the Hendrix experience was one of them. And so I saw them play, you know, live and up close. And I saw Cream. We opened for Cream. We opened for, for you know, the band that we became Chicago. They were called the Chicago Transit Authority. I opened up for, well, before that, they were the Illinois Speed Press, actually, after, before that. But before they became the Chicago Transit Authority. Anyway, I opened for a lot of bands. Wasn't good friends with Jimmy. But, you know, definitely got to see him. So somehow you can't believe everything that you read in Wikipedia. Yeah, for, for sure. And, you know, I, I think when somebody has a career that has spanned as much and, and has as much, you know, depth and width as your career, you know, some of these, are, you know, urban legends, you know, just kind of grow around people. You know, I mean, I, I've had, you know, I had the great Liberty DeVito on the show once and, you know, he said half of what you hear about me might be true. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yep. Um, he Lib is absolutely correct. You, you know, so, I mean, I, I just think some of those things grow. So um, your early career, your early life, let's put it that way. You, you're a, a Pennsylvania native. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm born in Pittsburgh. Okay. And you were you moved to L.A. when you were a fairly young man. But early on in your career, um, you know, you, you mentioned the band that did, you know, so many weeks at the Whiskey A Go Go. Is that really when you started networking and meeting some of these musicians that you would go on to record some of those, you know, just seminal records with is it just being part of the scene? Was that how those connections were made? You know, I've, I've never thought about it that way, but you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, being in, in the things to come and playing in the whiskey, playing at the Whiskey A Go-Go and being, you know, in the Hollywood scene in 19, uh, you know, 1968, 
uh, made a big difference. There was a lot, a lot of wonderful things happened between 1965 and 1975, and I just was lucky enough to be in the middle of it. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I, I mean, I think for me as a drummer, okay, first of all, I'm a huge Warren Zevon fan, and, and it's well documented, all the stuff you did with Warren, um, you, you know, the Jackson Brown stuff, um, you know, James Taylor, uh, the Sweet Baby James record, all, all of those records. Did you have any inkling when you were actually in the room that, you know, these are going to be songs that stand the test of time or, or were you just working? Well, I'll tell you what I, I'll tell you what I did know. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I just did a, an interview yesterday for the Joni Mitchell documentary that the BBC is doing. And, and one of the things that came, that came up that I realized is that in the, in the, the year 1970, I played on sweet, uh, the sweet baby James album tapestry and Joni Mitchell's blue in the same, all in one year. Wow. And that kind of sets up kind of how that time period was for me. What I did know about James and what I did know about Carol and what I did know about Joni is that they were completely unique and nobody had done anything like them before. You know, um, on the East Coast, there was a, 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 an amazing artist named Laura Nero who was doing the same kind of thing, but she was in New York. And uh, and I never got to play with Laura, but... But I knew that James and Joan and Carol and, and Warren and Jackson were all unique singer-songwriters, hadn't heard anything like what they were doing before. Did I know that it was going to be incredibly successful? No. I was 21 years old, and I was so happy to be working. You know, I would pinch myself every day. I go, God, I get to go. I get to go to work. Go to work today and play. You know, play James Taylor's music or or play Carol King's music or play with Joan Mitchell. I didn't have any idea. Hindsight's twenty twenty. I had no idea then how successful it was going to be. But um, you usually don't when you're right in the middle of working on something. You're you're concentrating on the craft, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I just. I, you know, I, I know you said you count your blessings, but looking back on it, um, and, and you're still creating music at, at such a high level, but looking back on some of those things, do, do you ever have the thought of, wow, I wish I had known then what I know now? I, I, I mean, I, I can't put myself in those shoes. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I'm so glad I didn't know. I would have been so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good point. Yeah. So, you know, on some of those sessions, on many of those sessions, I, I should say, you know, you were working with, with you know, Lee Sklar and, and Wadi Wachtel and, and Danny and, and all those guys. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of it is, uh, you know, after the James Taylor record, you guys were then employed to go out and tour with him. And that kind of created that nucleus of the immediate family. Is that kind of how that all unfolded? It's true. And the person that we, that all of us, Danny, Leland, Wadi, myself, have to thank is Peter Asher. You know, Peter had the vision of being the, being the producer and the manager of James Taylor at the time that he wanted James when, when we when the Sweet Baby James album came out and James was going to go on tour. Peter wanted James to sound. James was a folk singer. James never had a band. He would he would he would do shows by himself on a chair with an acoustic guitar. Peter wanted James to sound like the album, and so he he just that's he said I want you guys to come and 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 play live with him, and and it was Peter. It was you know to Peter's credit he he kind of started the ball rolling for us. He, he put credits on the James Taylor album and, uh, you know, uh, musician credits. And the only albums that had musician credits on it were jazz albums. So he kind of started that. So our names got known quite quickly and we had, we kind of reaped the benefit of that, that, you know, we, we have so much to be thankful for, for, for Peter employing us and, and wanting us to play, not just with James or with Linda Ronstadt and, you know, a lot of other people that were in his stable. So, 
Yeah. So we, we definitely benefited from that. And, and that was the nucleus of what has now become the immediate family. You're absolutely correct. Well, and, you know, for, for some of our younger listeners who probably don't remember a time, that was very um, cutting edge. I mean, it used to be you went in the studio, you had studio musicians that came in and played on your record, and then if you wanted to tour with a band, you went out and hired a band, right? But it was never, almost never the same guys that you recorded with. So that was a little bit different for that time, and it... it made you guys a band, for lack of a better term. Am I correct in saying that? Oh, absolutely. You're absolutely correct. And a perfect example of it is that, <clears throat> you know, the, the studio musicians that uh, were at the cream of the crop in the period of time before we came out here was the, was the Wrecking Crew. And the Wrecking Crew played on more records than, than you can possibly list. I mean, the list of the, the number one records that Hal Blaine played on is so huge. But they just played in the studio. You know, the birds would go into the studio and they would hire some of the Wrecking Crew to play on the album. The Mamas and Papas, that was the Wrecking Crew. The Beach Boys, that was the Wrecking Crew. But they never toured with any of those acts. If they would have, they would have, they, they would have reaped the same benefits that, that we did. But, you know, we were kind of the next generation of studio musicians in L.A. that, that followed them. And because of people like Peter Asher, we got to go on tour as well. That's the difference between the Wrecking Crew and the immediate family. We got to tour with the artists that we made the records with. And it just so happened to be that they're some of the most iconic artists that have ever been. Yeah, well, I mean, you said a mouthful there. And, you know, in all fairness, back in those days, you know, being on the road wasn't as lucrative as it is today. So, I mean, for somebody like Hal Blaine who could do, you know, three or four sessions a day, it would have been a huge pay cut for him to go on the road with, with an artist. No, absolutely. And, but now it's totally flipped. Now the only place you can make money is being on the road. <laughs> well, yeah, it, that, it, isn't that the truth? Um, you know, we, I have so many drummers on this show and we talk about it all the time. You know, some bands now don't even do a, a physical format release of their music. It's streaming only. And they're like, yeah, we're going to let everybody stream it for 99 cents or whatever and, and just stay on tour for the next two years to try to pay bills. Um, very different world now than it was in the 70s, for sure. Yeah. You know. And it's, it's, not, it's, the, it's, it's not equitable anymore. When the guy that owns Spotify has more money than all the artists put together, it's something's wrong with the system. Yes, uh, I would definitely agree with you there. Um, it's, you know, and, and I, I don't want to bemoan it and, and be the get off my lawn guy, but it really is the musicians are the last people to get paid in the equation now. And it's, it's, as you said, uh, highly, uh, unequitable. So, um, but anyway, I, I'll change gears just a little bit here. Um, I have listened to the immediate family release, um, and it is, as you can imagine, uh, for all of our listeners, absolutely phenomenal. And I read in some of the materials that, you know, this was cut over three or four days. Is it, is it like your favorite pair of sneakers when you go in the studio with those guys? Is it just that easy that you can create a masterful album in just a couple of days' time? Well, you hit the nail on the head. That's the, that's the most um, beautiful way to, to describe it. It is totally like putting on an old pair of sneakers. We love, we love playing music together. We, we make each other better as songwriters, as musicians, and uh, the, it's just an absolute joy. You know, absolutely. Oh, by the way, by the way, uh, the album debuted at number six on the Billboard Blues charts today. Oh, that's fantastic! I'm so glad to hear that, and and it really yeah, is. It it is so good. Great. Yeah, it's really great. Um, yeah. you, you, you know, and I, here's the thing. I mean, I I don't want to. Um, I, how do I say this? I I don't want to give people the wrong idea, but. If you're looking for great original music in this day and age, sometimes it's hard to find. And I'm telling my listeners now, this is a no-brainer, a can't-miss. You need to go pick up this record. It's it's that good. 
Yeah, we're very excited about it. Thank you for that. Uh, that's that's lovely of you to say. We uh, we're very proud of it, and uh, we're we're almost finished with a with a, a backup album we uh, that we just recorded um, a couple months ago. We have to cut a few more tracks, but um, we're going to have another record ready to go uh, first quarter next year when the, the documentary comes out that Denny Tedesco is making about us. So. Uh, we're very excited, very excited that this record is being so well received. Well, and, and as it should be, because it really is great. And, you know, there's I, I think there's a couple of live tracks on there and, and a great version of, you know, uh, things to do in Denver when you're dead, you know, which is a great, you know, Wadi co-write with with the with the late great Warren Zevon. As I mentioned, I'm a huge fan of his. Um, you know, but the original material is fantastic as well. How did the the songwriting go? When you guys went into the studio, w- would it be, hey, Danny's in here, he's got a song, we're going to work on that? Or was it a little bit more cohesive in the studio? Well, the songs the songs are all written uh, way before we go in the studio, and, and we have them well organized before, you know, we get in the studio. That's why we can, we cut, we cut that album, we cut 17 tracks in three days. Wow. But those are just the basic tracks, but we're, we're very prepared when we go in the studio. So, you know, there's no, there's not, there's not much song writing going on in the studio. All of that's done in, in the pre-production and prior to that. But it's like I said before, the way the co-writes go, Wadi or Danny or Steve or I will bring in a song and, or the ba- or ideas for lyrics or whether I go to Danny's house and work with him or get, get on the phone with Wadi or with Steve or whoever, it just kind of gets passed around. You know, it's kind of like, it's a, the immediate family is kind of like a writing machine. And, you know, you put, you put some ingredients in and then everybody else puts in their little, their, you know, what, whatever, you know, seasoning they need to put on it. And it just comes out better. You know, all, when it, the, a song, a song idea, or even if it's kind of finished, it, some of the songs that we bring in kind of get rewritten, you know, they get rewritten by just for, to make them, to make them fit the immediate family, you know? And, uh, uh, they, we just, we just make each other better as songwriters, as musicians. And, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of right now. It really, really is. It's uh, really a joy. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I've tried to put this in words for people. You know, I, I've had a longstanding musical affiliation with my band. You know, we've been playing together since we were kids. And I try to put it into words by saying it's almost like there's some sort of sixth sense in the room. Like there's this, you know, certain level of telepathy between all of us, and it's unspoken. I'm sure that you experience that, you know, for example, with Leland, you know, as the rhythm section, does that exist amongst you guys? Am am I saying that right? Oh, it definitely does. And, and the way, the way that it manifests itself is like, we know when something's right when we listen to a playback and, and conversely, we know when it's not right. You know, we'll, we'll cut it, we'll cut a track a couple times, do a couple takes and stop and go in and listen and if if it knocks our socks off, we it knocks us. It, it happens. It, the same thing happens to everybody. We look at each other and we go, "That's the shit. That's done. Let's go on to the next song." <laughs> or we'll go, or we'll go. It's not quite there yet. You know, it's not quite settled. It's not. It's not this or it's not that. And then we we find we fix what's wrong and then you know and move on. But there is a sixth sense that we all know when it's right and we all know when it's not right. Yeah. And, I, you know, I've just never been able to explain it to somebody that's never felt that before. But you do know when it's right. And, you know, in my musical situation, I know what those guys are thinking before they think it. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I, I feel that's the way we communicate. No. And for, like in between Leland and I, like we've been playing together so long. Just say it'll be a, like a, the beginning, the beginning of the last bar of of a verse that leads into a chorus. I'll hear him set up a lick that he he'll just start, and I know exactly what he's going to do, he, although he's never played it before. And I'll catch the end of it, and then we'll land on the chorus, and just that's called dynamics, right? 
Yeah. And he does the same thing with me. If I, if he'll, he'll hear me start something and then he'll join in and then we'll finish it together. So I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, for sure. And, I, you know, I, I've never been able to explain it to somebody. People will ask, you know, how did you know what was going to happen there? And you can't put it into words. You just know as a drummer. Right. Right. Um, you know, so I, I find it interesting that, that, you know, certain groups of individuals have that and certain groups of individuals don't have that. And that's the special sauce in my opinion. Oh, it totally is. And when, when you're fortunate enough to be playing with guys that all get that, it's, it's pure joy. Yeah, it, it certainly is. Um, so you recorded all these songs over a, a real short period of time. And the one thing that, that I'm most excited about, you guys are actually going out on the road with this, um, I, I think, starting in e- either October or November. Um, no, it's November. Okay. November 3rd, or our first gig out here on the West Coast. Okay, cool. So are you excited about that? I mean, it's. I'm assuming it's been a while since all of you guys have been out on the road together, right? Yeah, it has been, and we're very excited. We can't wait. Well, I mean, I'm looking forward to it for sure. Um, you know, I, I guess the question is, um, you know, you guys are all still going to like each other after being locked in a bus together for a while. And <laughs> we've been we've been on the road so much in our lives. It's just we're so looking forward to this. We really, really are. We can't afford a tour bus just yet. But uh, that'll be a luxury somewhere down the line. But, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going out with a Cadillac and a trailer. Not cheaper than. <laughs> nice. Uh, that's going to be awesome. Yeah. I mean, I just can't imagine, you know, standing outside a venue and seeing you guys roll out of a Cadillac with a trailer. That's that's a visual, right? <laughs> that's fantastic. So what else besides the immediate family, what else have you been working on here lately? I mean, I, I know that you are a, a highly in-demand guy. Uh, is there anything else that we should be looking for besides the immediate family? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I just finished working uh, three days in the studio with Peter Asher. Uh, he's producing Susanna Hoff's new record. Oh, Okay. And it's, it's fantastic. She's absolutely brilliant. You worked with her um, back in the, the 80s and 90s as well, correct? No, I never did. No, that, I, I, I never did. But, I, but I, did, I did like the Bengals a lot. I thought they were a great man. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, that's pretty cool. That's exciting. So I, let me ask you how you approach a session. And, and I don't know, you know, some guys want to hear demos of songs before they go in. Some people don't, they want to hear it, you know, for the first time when they're sitting behind their kit, how do you approach walking into a session? Uh, a, a lot of sessions these days. Well, how do I, how do I approach it? Let me see. I, I, I listen a lot. I want to. I, I look at the lyric sheet. I want to know what the song is about, and I try to. I try to come up with something that I've never played before. Those are the first things I think about. I. I, I try not to just play something that's normal. I'll, I try to think of something that would be unique for the song, but it has to fit the song. I. I don't want to play something u- that's unique to me but sucks for the song. I want to play something unique for the song if I can. If I can turn a beat around or, or play something, you know, kind of fun and new, I try to do that first. But sometimes you just have to go back to the tried and true things. So those are the first things I think about. But a lot of a lot of the a lot of the sessions that I do now, uh, there's a whole it's it's a a lot of pre-records are done. You know, there might be a rough vocal and a, uh, and a an acoustic guitar track or a piano track and some percussion. You know. The, people do a lot of pre-records. P- Peter did that with Susanna. A lot of the songs have, had already done had pre-records on them. So you really, so you really hear the vibe of the song already. You just have to, you know, kind of like do the, you know, the physician's creed of do no harm. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's always just. It- 
how do I say this? Um, I'm going to trip on my words here a little bit. Some of the stuff that I've done in my career has been the perfectly imperfect stuff, right? Where it's just like, hey, let's run through it once. And I, the first time I hear it, I go, yeah, I messed up here. I messed up there. You know, that doesn't feel right or whatever. And everybody else in the room loves it. Have you had those experiences? Yeah, listen to the Bob Dylan New Morning album. Listen to listen to the song "Sign on the Window." Okay, Is, uh, I would have I would have loved to have had a couple more takes of that. Working with Bob is interesting because most things are just one take. I, I've always heard that. I, I've always heard that it's you, you know Matt Chamberlain, uh, you know who who did some work with him recently. He told me he was like it is absolutely seat of the pants at all times. Was that your experience with Bob? Oh, for sure. But I loved it. You know, I absolutely loved it. And you 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 said it perfectly. You know, it's perfectly imperfect. Yeah. It, I don't know why, but it seems like those things, you know, I mean, and I've heard stories, you know, from, from guys like, you know, Roger Hawkins, you know, saying, yeah, I was just messing around and that's what ended up on the album, you know? Yeah. Well, Roger Hawkins, boy, do I love his playing. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, how could you not? Um, I, it's so, so sad. So yeah. sad. It really is. You know, we tried for a long time to get Roger on the show and, you know, we do most of these by telephone and, you know, his hearing just wasn't uh, good enough to do a phone interview and and I never could make the trip to Muscle Shoals. And that's one of the big regrets in my life because he was such a huge influence on me. Uh, he always just played the perfect part for the song, much as you do. Yep, he definitely did. So, But a huge huge talent. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it just goes without saying. Um, so I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask, you know, and, and I don't want to put you on the spot, certainly, but are there, are there albums or tracks that you now point to and say, that was the perfect song that I played on? Uh, or does that thought never occur to you? Perfect, the, per, the perfect song or the, the part that I played really fit the, fit the song? or Well, let's do both. Well, a, a, a song that I'm, a track that I, song that I played on that I'm particularly proud of is Bill Withers' Lovely Day. Oh, yeah, that's a great one. Um, I mean, I'd have to include Fire and Rain in there somewhere. Absolutely. That's another huge one. I mean, I, I maybe, just... Maybe. Maybe the edge of seventeen, Stevie Nicks. Uh, wow, I mean, see, you're even naming stuff now that that almost slips the memory, right? Uh, of wow, yeah, that was Russ that played on that. You know, um, I, your discography is so vast; it it makes me wonder: are, are there things that you hear now and say? Oh yeah, I played on that. Or do you remember them all? I don't know. No, I don't remember them all. But some in, in, in interviews or things, and some people point out to me, you know, well, you know, in such and such year you played on. I went, oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Have to remember d during during that period of time there was we, there was a lot of smoking and marijuana going on. Yeah. So. And you kind of you might not remember everything that happened. <laughs> what? Well, I, I don't know if it, if if it's just back then. I mean, I th I think that's still kind of prevalent in the music industry. But but to your point, you know, I I mean, I guess in some of your busiest times, you were probably doing multiple different sessions every week, right? For sure. Oh yeah. I, yep. I mean, during that time, I, I would think, you know, the, you, you already mentioned one, the, the great Hal Blaine. Of course, Jeff Pecoro was, you know, doing his thing during that time as well. And, and you, did did all of you guys hang out? I mean, was there a, a, a uh, you know, let's talk shop. What are you working on? Here's what I'm working on. Was there any of that stuff going on? Uh, to, to some degree, but, you know, everyone was so busy then. You know, and yet, and very seldom were there two drummers on a session. You know, um, 
But speaking of two drummers on a session, uh, I did get to do uh, one of the best drummers to play double drums with in the entire world is Jim Keltner. And my dear friend, Jimmy Lee, I got to, we both played on James Taylor's uh, How Sweet It Is to Be Loved by You. Most people don't know that that's both of us playing on that track. Oh, I, I didn't know that. And I'm a huge fan. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he just he just knows exactly what to play with other drummers and he just makes it more powerful. He, you know, he doesn't need to have another drummer when Jimmy Lee plays. He can cover it all by himself. But, but uh, we were, you know, drummers... There, in sessions, there usually weren't two drummers, so we didn't get to hang out too much other than on breaks or on lunch breaks or something. If somebody was down the hall, you could you could say hi or have a cigarette or something, but, you know, not necessarily. I mean, a lot of mutual respect, but other than, other than when you got together with your drum company, that's when you would hang out with other drummers. Like, I was with Yamaha for a very long time. I'm with DW now and quite happy, but... Uh, but, you know, you would go to uh, around NAM. you know, you'd get together with lots of other drummers that endorse the same equipment you do. And then you would get to hang with them. Yeah. I mean, I just can't even imagine, you know, having, you know, you and Keltner or you and Jimmy Lee in the same room. I mean, that's just the, the, the wealth of knowledge there, uh, I, you know, again, you know, for a mere mortal such as myself, I just can't even imagine it really. Well, it's like it's like I said, I was doing a lot of pinching myself <laughs> during those days. So. Yeah, for sure. Well, so what would you tell you know young players, you, you know guys that are just coming up through the ranks? You know, what is the secret to longevity such as yours in the music business at such a high level? Is is it you know, equal parts luck and talent? Is it being in the right place at the right time? What, what would you say? Well, first of all, I don't know if it's possible anymore because the music business has changed so much. You know, when I was working, there were rec the, the, the record labels really supported the artists. That's when artist development really mattered, you know. They weren't necessarily interested in your first or second record being a hit. They, were, they wanted to build you as an artist. They were, you know, they'd, they'd stay with you. So therefore, when the record labels were really supporting the artists, there was lots of work for musicians. It's not the case anymore. So, so that's taken out of the equation. The best advice I could give a young player coming up, and it doesn't matter what instrument, is find other people that play different instruments that are like-minded and serious, get into a garage, and play till your hands bleed. Yeah, man, that's... That's great advice. That's the, that's the path that I followed, you know, and I mean, it, it worked for me. I mean, I think everybody just wants that instant gratification, you know, the, the Instagram yeah. like or the Facebook or, or, or whatever the case may be. It doesn't seem like young artists put in the work the way, I, you know, it used to have to be. Um, I read an, an article once uh, was in the interview with Steve Martin and he was talking in the interview about when people ask him this question that you just asked me, well, how do you get to be successful as a comedian and how do you, how do you get to, you know, and go on and make movies and, and write and write good comedy. And, and Steve, Steve kind of like, you know, did one of his kind of put his hand on his face and kind of thinking and he goes, well, first of all, you have to be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. So that's it. You know, when I say get into a garage with other musicians that play different instruments and play until your hands bleed, I think I read that something that that's something that Dave Grohl said in an interview. But but that's really it because if you do that and you play a lot of music with other guys and whether it becomes a band or not, but if you do it and you're serious about it, you will get good, but you have to get good. Yeah, I mean it, it, that's exactly right. And another thing that, that, you know, we harp on on this podcast all the time is you have to treat every gig, every session as though your life depends on it. Because, you, you know, I mean, I've done my fair share of, you know, bad, you know, wedding reception kind of gigs. 
but you never know when that bass player that you're playing with that weekend might call you two weeks later and say, hey, I want you to play on my record, right? It's true. You, you know, I it's mean, totally you, you just have to make those connections. And if you do a good job in a situation where you're not, you, you know, it, it may not be the most uh, rewarding thing in the world for you, you might make a connection that changes your life. Yeah, it's a, another way to look at it is it, when you walk into, this is true for anything in life, any kind of job, you know, find out what's needed and wanted and produce or present it. And then that doesn't mean play every lick that you know on one song. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Russ, certainly. I don't want to do that, but one of the things that I say all the time is it's not necessarily about the notes you play. It's about the ones you don't. Have you That's ever true. heard, have you ever heard that in a recording studio from a producer? I'll bet you have. Um, I, I've never, well, producers might say, you know, the part you're playing is too complicated. Simplify it. Or, you know, or don't play 16 notes on the hi hat. Try playing quarters and stuff like that really matters. You know, subdivision which is drums are all about subdivision and any rhythmic instrument is is about subdivision and you know if they're playing if you're playing subdivided parts together they have to match or there's or it's a cacophony of of sound you know so so simplifying parts is a key to to great arrangements you know and then make and, and it's really difficult with drums you know with with a guitar or a keyboard, you can just lay out, right? Right. Well, the drums really, drums really can't stop unless it's a breakdown or unless it's two bars that have no music in them of any kind of rhythm. But, but so you have to pick parts that serve the song. You just have to serve the song, and uh, and make make the producer happy and make the artist make them make them want you back. That's why I say find out what's needed and wanted. And produce or present it, you know, that's the key, really. Yeah, I mean, I, you've not said anything in this interview that I disagree with or can disagree with. I mean, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head on all of it. Um, do you approach things differently when you are in the producer's chair than when you're playing drums? Uh, or do you uh, approach things differently if you're doing both? Uh, because I know you produce other artists' stuff, um, do do you think of it as a drummer, or what what is your process when you're in the producer's chair? Is my question, I guess. Oh, it, it's different. It's harder. If I'm if I'm playing drums and producing, that's not easy. That's a little harder, and you have to really take off one hat and put on the other. Um, but when, if I'm just producing, I love just producing and and having other drummers play because it's just one less, you know, I don't have to worry about playing the right part. I can, <laughs> I, I'll know hear it, you know? So, so if, if it doesn't have to come from me, it's just easier, but I approach it the same way. You know, it's, it's the same set of logic for me. Okay. Well, you know, it, when you hard, ha when go ahead, it's hard. It's harder when you're playing and producing because as a player, I'll, I'll come in, it, it's very tempting to come into the control room and just listen to the drum part and, 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 and notice the things that I'm ha unhappy with that I did or, or I want to do it again because I forgot something. You can't look at it that way if you're producing. You have to hear the whole thing. You know, any, any part nowadays can be fixed, you know. Like, so I wouldn't want to go out. I would hate to make the mistake of saying, let's go out and do another take just because I wanted to play a better part. You know, I might have played. I might have played the part that I'm unhappy with on an earlier take. I might have played it correctly, and we could just drop it in. And instead of you know, and everybody else's part's fine. Why should I make them go do it again? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, that's a good point. H have you ever produced another drummer that is intimidated to be drumming in front of Russ Kunkel? Um, no, not anyone that's ever told me that. Uh, <laughs> I produced a lot of Jimmy Buffett albums and Jimmy's drummer is a wonderful drummer and great songwriter and good singer. His name's Roger Guth. And, uh, and Roger's just excellent. Everything he played was absolutely perfect. 
You know, he's, you know he, he nailed it every time. We're good friends. I don't think he was ever intimidated by me at all. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, if I ever had the good fortune of, you know, playing on a record you were producing, I would absolutely be shitting bricks. I'll just tell you that right now, you know, because the the guy behind the glass can come out here and, and school me, that kind of thing. You know, I, I just I just wondered if you'd ever run across that. I, I haven't. No, I haven't. I would go out of my way whoever the drummer is to make them feel comfortable so that they didn't have to shit bricks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think you're a pretty laid back and cool guy, Russ, and I, I would expect nothing less from you. So um, I want to be respectful of your time. I, I, this has been just such a thrill to me to have you on the show. Uh, your career is just so legendary and you've played on so many just, you know, fantastic records um you know what advice would you give and we we scratched on this a little bit earlier but you know if you had to boil it all down into a good piece of advice for for other musicians you know what would it be just listen listen as much as you can listen to the music that's going on around you that's coming through the headphones and you know, wait for the wait for the muse to uh, for your own muse to tell you what to play. You know, listen to what everyone else is playing and and play something that that makes them all sound better. Yeah, man, that's that's great advice, Russ. It and, really is. And, and and if if you really don't know what that sounds like, just listen to any Rolling Stones record and listen to whatever Charlie Watts is playing. Ah. Uh. See, there you go. Um, we, of course, we lost Charlie, uh, you know, a couple of weeks back. And man, you know, you talk about somebody that knew exactly what the song needed and the economy of not putting anything that wasn't needed. It's Charlie Watts. Yeah. That's a, that's a profoundly sad loss. It, it really is. And, you know, I mean, I, I've been sad when we've lost other great musicians over the years, but, uh, you know, I bawled my eyes out when I read that. I mean, it, it really is the end of an era in rock and roll. It's true. There's not many left, you know, we have Ringo, you know, we have, we have a few, but, but not many. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, that was, a, a you said it, a profoundly sad loss. So, Russ, let's end on an upbeat note here. Uh, the immediate family uh, is out. It's on the street. Folks, go pick up a copy of this record. It is so tremendously good. I, I just can't put into words how awesome it is. I've been burning it up. It's fantastic. And you guys are going on the road in November. How long is the tour going to last? Are you adding dates? It's actually, it's up on our website, the immediate family, uh, the immediate family.com. The tour's up there. We start, uh, here in my hometown in San Clemente at the coach house. And then we go up to Santa Barbara, the La Barrow theater. And then we play in thousand Oaks at, um, the Canyon club. And then we go East and we start up in Connecticut at a, uh, a, a, a kind of a, a benefit for autism. Uh, that's all that that's a big thing that happens up there every year. And then we head down to Philadelphia and New York city, kind of just, up, you know, some other shows down the, down the East coast. And then in February we have, we're on the rock legends cruise, uh, out of Fort Lauderdale. And then we're playing a couple of dates down in Florida in February, the funky biscuit and some other place and more dates to be added COVID permitting. Yeah, well, uh, from your lips to God's ears, as we say here in the South, and I will say to the folks that are listening in your neck of the woods, the Coach House is a fantastic place to catch a gig. I've been there many times. Um, it is uh, just a great place to catch a live show. So uh, go go see Russ in his hometown there in, in the San Juan Capistrano area of Southern California. Jamie, thank you so much for having me. 
Russ, uh, again, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Uh, keep us posted on everything going on with the immediate family. We'll have you back anytime your schedule permits, sir. Okay, thank you. God bless you. All right, see you now. Bye. All right, guys and girls, that's going to wrap up episode 137 of the Drum Shuffle podcast. Again, many thanks to Russ for taking time out of his busy schedule to come on the show. Uh, What an honor for me to have him on the show. Uh, Just, again, one of my all-time favorite drummers. He's played on so many iconic and great records. It was a real treat for me to have him on, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, As I say each and every week, uh, please hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you use to listen to the podcast. It helps us more than you'll ever know. The biggest help you can provide to the show is to share a link with a friend. Uh, It helps us more than you'll ever know, and we simply can't thank you enough for tuning in week in and week out. It is the reason we keep going. We have some great episodes coming up that you're not going to want to miss. Next week, I'm going to be joined by Lucas Garcia from the band Down Again. Uh, Fantastic band out of California. They're doing a lot of great work. And Lucas is one of those up and coming drummers that everybody should know about. So hit the subscribe button so you don't miss that episode next week. As I say, every week we answer every single email that we get here at the podcast. Our email address is thedrumshufflepodcast at gmail.com. Our web address is thedrumshuffle.com. And you can always find more information on me over at jamieeds.com. I hope everybody has a great week out there. As always, your homework assignment, go see a live band if it is safe for you to do so before live music goes away completely. So until next time, may your head stay strong and your sticks never break. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.